Um, our next speaker is a businesswoman and a frequent speaker at our independence events. Um, she's a member of Women for Independence and also for, of English People for Independence. And she lives in Sylington. And she, she says she's just an ordinary mum, but those of us that know her think it's probably more like extraordinary. Um, but please welcome Suzanne Kim. <laughs> I'm not going to try and cover what Isabel's said, I think she's covered that very well. Um, and I think I need to. I've been looking at this whole independence referendum from a slightly different perspective, being English and having lived both sides of the border. Uh, having talked to my English family and friends, and obviously family and friends in Scotland, I used to believe it was just the Scots who were told they were subsidised. Um, but apparently no, it actually spread across the whole country because my family, my own family in England firmly believe that Scotland is subsidised to this day through careful manipulation of our media they've done the classic dividing rule they have pitched England against Scotland and that has been going on for generations this isn't something new with the referendum that's been going on for a long, long time my own brother even refers to those subsidised jocks. Okay, it's said in a very jokey way, but there's a quite murky background behind it. It's quite <laughs> disturbing to see the different newspapers that my family have in England and then see the exact same Scottish edition up here with completely differing headlines. You'll have one in England to say there's a billion pound black hole in pensions, but you'll have one in Scotland to say that Pensions are only safe in Scotland with a no vote. So you're getting one side played up against the other, and it's truly shocking. In fact, if you ever go onto a Scottish article on either the Telegraph or the Guardian, some of the hateful comments on there towards Scotland are it beggars belief. But it's purely down to manipulation by the media. These people are being spoon-fed propaganda, just as we are in Scotland. So. I think some people in Scotland, though, and quite a lot of people still believe what Isabel was saying, that Scotland is subsidised. They still believe this myth that we're not good enough, we're not big enough, we're not strong enough. We've got to stay under this lovely umbrella of Westminster to be able to face this terrible world. So let's have a look at what the No Camp is saying. Number one, I'm going to, I'm going to sound like I've got news to you without the chauvinistic men now, sorry. But number one, we can't afford it, we spend more than we make. Trouble is, that's not quite true. For instance, in the year 1112, £53 billion pounds was collected from Scotland in taxes and duties, etc., and sent down to Treasury in Westminster. £46 billion came back to Scotland to be spent on all services in Scotland. Now, we've got £7 billion of a difference here. But that's not where it ends. Westminster and the Unionist campaign add on another 10 million on top of that onto our so-called spend in Scotland to create a 17 billion difference. Now, you need to pick that apart to see where those figures are coming from because as far as they're concerned, we are then subsidised. We send less back, less to the Treasury than we get back. That's not strictly true. The seven billion, the seven, well, the seven billion and the 10 billion added together, the 10 billion itself is borrowed by Westminster on our behalf. Now that is debt, but that is added on to Scotland's share, which we then have to pay interest on. That is debt that had Scotland been independent, we wouldn't have needed. And the 7 billion, well that's our share of things like Trident, nuclear weapons, the London Olympics and the Jubilee, the war in Afghanistan, the repayments for Iraq, the Falklands, replacing London's sewer, system, London's sewer system, the high speed rail from London to Manchester, celebrating the outbreak of the Great War, refurbishing the Houses of Parliament, the excellent road network down the southeast that we've all seen, Boris Island, that's a good one, the Metropolitan Police, English Forces bases, and the fight against Scottish self-determination. That's what we are paying for. 
And that is the money that the unionists count for adding on to Scotland's spend to make it look like we're subsidised when it's simply not true. In fact, a better infographic to show you would be this. You vote no, and for every pound that Scottish taxpayers send to Westminster, we get back 70 pence. You vote yes, for every pound we collect, we keep one pound. Simple as that. So number two on the countdown, we won't get a currency union. Now, apart from the fact Alistair Darling let the cat out of the bag the other night at the uh, debate, Norway and Sweden, did you know they kept their currency union for nine years when they became independent from each other in 1905? And incidentally, if you look at the figures for Norwegian independence in August 1905, the yes vote was 368,208. The no was 184 people. Apparently they were Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Another bit of information with the, the currency union. In the 2008 banking crisis, sterling is devalued by approximately 3%. That's what contributed to the 2008 <coughs> basic decimation of the economy of the UK. If Westminster are going to cut off their nose and not enter into a currency union with Scotland, there will be an immediate devaluation of sterling by 10%, because that is the value that Scotland carries in sterling. So you think about that and how that will affect the rest of the UK if they cut off their nose to spite their faces. That is why there will be a currency union. So number three. Border controls, I love this stuff. I mean, I would love border controls if it meant big burly men in leather, you know, to check me down at the borders, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> Anyone who's ever been to Ireland? Anyone been to Southern Ireland? Yep. Even the sheep cross the border unattended. There is massive fields between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. So anyone that tells you there's going to be border control, border controls with a differing immigration policy are incorrect. Southern Ireland have got a slightly differing immigration policy to the rest of the UK. There's no border controls between the two of us. In fact, I can even guarantee, when you think of France and Belgium, for instance, I did this last year, um, we drove down to France, and for some reason our sat-nav sat decided to go AWOL on us on the, as we got off the ferry. We were heading for Paris, and just as we were driving up the road, this big, lovely big motorway, and I looked and went, what's that bee surrounded by the blue stars on that sign? We were in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, we were in Belgium. We hadn't seen any border posts. There wasn't any big burly men, unfortunately, standing waiting to check us down. We'd crossed the border through Europe, which happens over every European border. So, unfortunately, there will be no border controls. Unless Westminster want to start playing nasty, they're the ones that will put border controls up. They're an independent Scotland, will not have border controls. Number four, pensions. Now, have anybody seen the lovely letters, the lovely leaflets that have been coming out from uh, Better Together, UK, No Thanks, whatever they're called, just recently, um, stating that or your pensions are at risk. I mean, even Gordon Brown having the gall to turn round and tell you your pensions are going to be at risk in independent Scotland. A ball, they're cheap. <laughs> Unfortunately for Gordon Brown, the Department of Work and Pensions wrote to an Abedonian man a while ago, and it states, if Scotland does become independent, this will have no effect on your state pension. You will continue to receive it just as you do at present. Oops, Gordon Brown. And number five, the EU. Apparently in independent Scotland, all five million of us are going to be catapulted out of the EU on day one of independence. Unfortunately for the naysayers, Graham Avery, who is a senior member of St Anthony's College, Oxford University, a senior advisor at the European Policy Centre in Brussels, an honorary director general of the European Commission, wrote a paper for Westminster, which is publicised on their website. <coughs> His report says, 
Arrangements for Scotland's EU membership would need to be in place simultaneously with independence. Fair enough. Scotland's 5 million people, having been members of the EU for 40 years, have acquired rights as European citizens. For practical and political reasons, they could not be asked to leave the EU and apply for readmission. Negotiations on terms of membership would take place in the period between the referendum and the date of independence. The EU would adopt a simplified procedure for the negotiations, not the traditional procedure followed for the accession of non-member countries. So yet again, a report straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, Westminster Commission report available on their website. Scotland will remain a member of the EU throughout the transition period, which cannot be said due to recent, recent happenings down in Westminster for the rest of the UK. Carswell is just the first. And number six, and possibly one of the most uh, <coughs> annoying of the lot that keeps coming around on a really bad carousel, the oil is running out. Now, you have clever ma manipulation by the media with this one, because they concentrate all the time on the reports of oil in the North Sea. And yes, completely agree, the oil in the North Sea is running out. We have taken a lot of the oil out of that sea. Well, ignore the fact that the Wood Report actually completely contradicted, its, contradicted itself within the space of literally three or four months. But yes, oil is running out. But what they ignore on all of the news broadcasts is the west coast, the huge bonanza that's sitting under the water of the west coast of Scotland. The fact that our west coast of Ayrshire could be regenerated by getting rid of Trident and making loads and loads of jobs extracting oil from that west coast. The Isle of Lewis, the Shetland Isles, the Clare Fields, you won't see that on a BBC broadcast because they concentrate your mind on the North Sea. They're not actually telling lies, because yes, it is running out in the North Sea, but it's not on the West Coast. So to sum it up, I think I'm not going to take lectures on someone, on the future of our oil and shipbuilding industry from people who de-industrialised Scotland and lied to us about the reserves. I'm not going to take lectures on nuclear weapons from those who don't live with them in their backyards. I'm not going to take lectures on the economy from people who presided over the worst banking crash since the 1920s. <coughs> I'm not going to take lectures on care for the elderly and the disabled by this first government to be inspected by the UN on disability rights violations. I'm not going to be lectured by a government who has increased poverty in this country to the point where 13 million people across the UK are living in food poverty and food bank usage is not only regarded as people on benefits, unemployed on benefits, it's for the working poor too. I'm not going to take any lectures off people that have caused that by Westminster austerity whilst the top five wealthiest families in this country own more money and assets than the bottom 20% of us all across the UK. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to vote yes. I'm going to vote yes for a much fairer system. I'm going to vote yes for the chance to have a good relationship with our nearest neighbours. I'm going to vote yes to show the rest of the UK the way it can be done. I'm going to vote yes for freedom. Thank you.